I'm going to try to summarize uh, what I mean by narrative architecture. And the purpose is to prime the workshop tomorrow. And, uh, but of course, some of you won't be at the workshop, so I've brought along a couple of books. Here's, here's a, a crib sheet for you if you want to follow it up. And a couple of weeks ago, NATO, as uh, Will mentioned, was uh, remembered in the first book written by an outsider to the group. Um, <clears throat> so this is a sketch of how one might set about designing with narrative. And um, I just want to go through a little bit of scene setting. I graduated a very long time ago at the AA in 1974. And towards the end of that decade, I guess the cool subjects were rational architecture, as in this catalogue from the Triennale Museum in Milan, uh, that staged this very important exhibition <coughs> that we all went to. And Charles Jenks was the master of interpreting architectural styles and semiology. And uh, he, this was one iteration of his book, The Language of Postmodern Architecture. Uh, and these two were the poles that uh, kind of made up what you kind of had to work out uh, in relation to your own work. So either you could go with one of these, you could do kind of postmodernism with lots of smudging and apparent kind of uh, sandstorms, or you could do extremely uh, um, uh, set hard architectural drawings. And this might surprise you, but this is uh, a project, a competition entry of my own uh, in 1976, I think. And you can see that I've been really intoxicated by the idea of postmodern language. Uh, in fact, going even harder core into classicism than many of my contemporaries. This was for a housing project at Millbank and was actually built with a similar curve, but the, the conceit was to take classical uh, typologies, namely the one of the theater, and place it, build it around the river, so the river would be the stage, and the tide would either flood the fountains or not. But I think looking back at it now, it's a shame that I didn't show the movement of the tide, but rather chose to make it into a fixed entity. This is part of the group of drawings that have been in the v &A, uh, drawing collection um, from soon after these drawings were done. But 1977, everything changed. Not necessarily in terms of architectural thinking that uh, uh, was beginning to, uh, to be derived from French philosophers. Um, Baudrillard, Derrida, all of that. Uh, were being looked at very, very closely, the notion of the fold in architecture. But London um, and all the people that I knew in it was changing dramatically. And uh, uh, perhaps that were, there were many reasons for that. But the vision of uh, the no future that came with punk uh, was also associated not only with music, but with fashion and with the way that people behaved in a city. And, of course, it exploded and influenced just about every creative field. This image uh, is taken from one of Derek Jarman's films, who uh, tried to give uh, punk a kind of uh, storytelling potential with his film Jubilee, which came out, I think, in 1980, or maybe 79. So the mood had changed, and uh, it was very particularly London and UK-centric. Uh, Malcolm McLaren, Vivian Westwood had a shop on the King's Road that kept changing its name. One iteration was Seditionaries, another was Sex, uh, and it ended up with her own name, Viv uh, Vivian Westwood. But they constantly changed, shifted and changed according to kind of situationist moves at the time that would try to keep everyone on their toes. And of course we all fell for it. We were all completely intoxicated by this um, this anything goes, we can do it, and uh, a no future future. In 1980, I went to New York, so I was teaching at a college outside Manhattan, and up until that time, much artwork had been 
uh, conceptual or performance based. And Bernard Chumi, who was my tutor at the AA, uh, was very captivated by all of that, and that was one reason why he moved to New York. But when I went to New York a couple of years later, there was something new, which was sort of related to a punk. It was uh, an art movement called the Trans Avant Garde. And in that, this might look kind of uh, uh, familiar territory now, but at the time, this was going against <coughs> black and white photography, sometimes in installations, in spaces, the dryness of conceptual art and uh, performance art uh, being replaced with a kind of expressionistic desire to show your action, your mood, your emotion in the way that the picture was executed. There were tons of artists doing this stuff and there was a quiet revolution going on in the galleries across Manhattan. And um, I, I must say, I was very willing to be influenced by all of that. And uh, in 1982, I mean, we're sort of incrementally nudging forward, I suppose this is the first project I did which had a willfully trans avant-garde spirit behind it. It consists only of these two drawings. It follows the, uh, the triumph of Mrs. Thatcher's triumph of, the, of winning the Falklands War. And it was a project that I did along with my students. It was the first project of the year, it must be 1982. They were asked to do a museum for the Falklands War somewhere in London, and I did my own. And um, uh, used up lots of paint and uh, tried to capture the city, the broader context of the city. So, if this is going to work for me, this little pointer thing. This is the Isle of Dogs which at the time, as you've seen in the Derek Jarman slide, was derelict. Um, there were, the, the, the docks were still full, um, but uh, we had thought the Isle of Dogs could actually be an independent state. In fact, that was the work of this year. And uh, for my version of the museum, I wanted to use a, a warship as the, 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 the museum entity, and it would be moored at a place called Globe Steps, which actually exists. And there's the globe, and there's some boats going around it. And the river is painted in a very kind of kokochka, very expressionistic style, with tons of colours, but there are little details that suggest various manoeuvres, like the little barges uh, um, that are on, a, a, on the beach, they're, they're kind of barges for troops, but they're docking at a place where barges at that time were still mended to make them river worthy. Um, what became Canary Wharf up here, and the development now that you, you will be familiar with all of this, has totally changed. And it's not strictly representative, but it captures a mood where you could pick out certain features like this church and other buildings that would um, orientate uh, where we are. And the museum itself, here's the boat, the entrance to the museum, it's a bit like the design museum, really. Um, you, here's a staircase that goes up and up and up and up, as though flames that have um, resulted from the attack on this ship into a structure with uh, exhibition spaces perched above the river, and ambiguously, is this a ghost, or a, you know, is it a dead figure, or um, is it actually a structure? And it says, 82 in the corner. So, this was part of what became a kind of movement, sort of by accident, because doing drawings like this was thought to be not architectural, but that was kind of the idea, was to link architecture <coughs> with other creative fields. Um, my students were given a hard time, my students and I were given a hard time in um, uh, 1983, from which, the result of which is that we were asked by the chairman of the AA, Alvin Boyarsky, to, um, to make a book but we thought that magazines were much more in the spirit of the time. And we formed the NATO group, Narrative Architecture Today group, 
and published this magazine and had quite a few exhibitions, not just in the AA, but in museums and galleries, both in the UK, Scotland, and in the US. So it kind of exploded. And it suggested, the point of NATO was to suggest that architecture is a kind of way of life. It was a way of thinking. It was a way of capturing your own desires and building them into your picture of what the city could be. A project that I did sometime after working with NATO was called Ark Albion, 1984. It was a response to um, an invitation to exhibit in the members' rooms at the AA. And, of course, there's free sketching in here. It looks at the area of County Hall and uh, St. Thomas's Hospital, Waterloo Station, all around um, the South Bank, opposite the Houses of Parliament, which, incidentally, what, uh, uh, had succeeded, Mrs. Thatcher and, and, and Parliament had succeeded in clo closing down the GLC and uh, basically war across the two sides of the river. So I thought that this area could be a very, could be subject to a very interesting uh, set of transformations that would render it a kind of open living exhibition of architecture. A bit like the Festival of Britain that had been there uh, in 1951. And the, the method really was to both document what was there and imagine how, in a kind of, as though a, a vast building site, how what was there could be edged towards a more open, more uh, uh, event and experientially based kind of city. So it's full of uh, um, apparent uh, building sites with lots of rubbish chutes and tarpaulins and scaffolding all over everything. Uh, signs of the city in a, fa a phase of change. And I think by now, we've probably never seen more <coughs> scaffolding or more tarpaulins or more cranes or shrubby shoots on buildings. It's sort of become the way London is. These lines are each elongated sections. And of course, there were more scaled drawings or maps that were able to substantiate what these is. They're not just kind of created out of nothing. But they cut through this site in various directions and gave me almost like a movie storyboard way of looking at the way that buildings and places and spaces actually exist cheek by jowl and subject them to, to how uh, they might be transformed. I'm not going to show you very much from this project um, uh, now, but this sort of sense of metamorphosis uh, is... Um, Okay. So there were sets of drawings, there were six drawings, there are six drawings like this that take up particular parts of the of this area of London. So this is the old county hall up here. And uh I kind of partly demolished it in order to open it up to order to, for public space to go in and out of it. There are walkways that move through it. There are lots of spiraling and a sense of motion, sometimes actually built, like you might expect at a fun fair or in a, kind of in a park. And sometimes um, the, these lines, particularly the big orange ones, are suggesting a kind of flow of energy that is not built, but is gives you the spatial sense, opens up the spatial sense of that particular place. So, what is narrative architecture? Well, it's certainly not architecture that tells a story or stories. That's too banal. It catches narrative which is non-linear. There are it. it weaves together fragments of narrative. And when I say narrative, a bit like an advert that suggests an event that is continuing, that uh, something has happened and something else might be about to happen, but in order to get through that moment, you have to buy that scent. That's a narrative that's similar to what I'm talking about. 
but it it encapsulates an architecture that includes us, <coughs> includes people and what they're experiencing. Because experience is a little fragment of narrative. And it puts together this experience with a, a deep and, and very pragmatic understanding of place. So if you're studying a place, just like I was studying Camp T Hall, it's pointless to try to construct something new unless you really understand what's there already. And I think I share that, that position with other members of the panel, that, that uh, being able to observe what's around you and look beyond the obvious is um, kind of a necessity for uh, any form of design. So, it's experience, place and purpose, and it's also playful, pragmatic, and multi-layered. In other words, it's synthetic. In 1992, um, Alvin Boyarski, chairman of the AA, asked me to do an exhibition in the main gallery. And it kind of set in motion a whole sequence of works which in some ways continue to uh, even now. And this was the largest image in that exhibition. It was called Extra City. People were popping pills at the time. But I didn't just mean it for that reason. I meant it because to have a re the reward of pleasurable experiences is, I think, one of what we expect cities to be. Of course, there are issues of sustainability and functionality and uh, 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 economy and value and all of that. But Exeter City sought to superimpose on the existing city, and here we're looking at Trafalgar Square over here and St Paul's over here, so a piece of the riverbank. It seems to be obsessed with riverbanks. The river, of course, is a big piece of landscape that can be tamed to a certain extent, but it can't be totally tamed and dominated. It's, it has a, a freedom which I think is uh, very important in kind of thinking of the perspective is what we do, what is free, uh, what is natural, and what is urban. But then in that, I've superimposed uh, large kind of platoon-like um, structures which are freely organic, and they suggest new kinds of connections between the banks and the river, uh, new links inside the city itself, uh, some structures hovering over existing buildings, and for some reason, which I can't fully explain, this uh, has the, the, the sleeping giant has become a bit of a motif in my work. Uh, I guess it comes from the first Al uh, NATO um, uh, magazine, which was dedicated to the giant Albion. And the Albion was a way of kind of reinforcing that punk kind of um, concentration on what Britain actually means. Um, and in that, another part of that exhibition, there were some pretend uh, uh, computer uh, um, screens, a program that we kind of invented. It didn't really work, but it looked good in the exhibition and it made you think about what a computer was going to be able to do. And it had um, various uh, uh, transformational um, uh, commands which could take the energy of what the city would read the energy, and, uh, and I haven't got all of them here, but they're, 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 the, the process involved in this, um, in this design development was to capture the energy of what I could uh, identify in that part of London to look at the people who were there, to look at uh, kind of the, the to, super, to superimpose new programmatic elements on top of the existing city. And one of the commands that you could uh, activate was to um, extemporize or to, to, to capture and to transform, which I think is a fundamental aspect of what I think of as narrative. This, uh, this then became the backbone of what I did uh, as a practicing architect. And when I was invited to go to Japan, I'd done one project before this, but this project was on one of the busiest corners in Tokyo. 
It was said to be the biggest pedestrian crossing in the world. And there was an awful lot of other noise going on on the street. So don't think this was going to stand out. This wasn't being set in kind of Regent's Park, you know, <laughs> classical setting. This had this. There was a building next door which had a giant seed and a plant on the front that was 40 meters high. So it was kind of vibrating. It was um, <coughs> super active. So what did these people want? The clients they wanted a new. Um, iteration of the cafe at the front of this department store called Parco, and they wanted it to celebrate the fact that Japanese people, were, like never before, were really into traveling. They wanted to go to Rome, to Paris, to New York. They wanted real experiences, real. Um, and uh, up until that time, in Japan, there had been umpteen versions of every kind of foreign entity, but they were always a bit too small or not really. They were done by Japanese architects who didn't understand Western proportion and the spirit of kind of Western spaces. So, the client in this case said they wanted they wanted a, a, a cafe that would make people feel as they were as though they were linked to Europe. So I, in partly in understanding the space, which has got this big overhang and then tons of concrete building above it, I knew that it was slightly theatre-like and that I could play on the prototype of the theatre, of the proscenium arch, using an aircraft wing to create that transition between the outside and the inside. But that was all part of the narrative that was drawn from Fellini's film La <coughs> Dolce Vita which I took all the artists and designers that worked with from outside our architectural team, a big group as though, you know, reliving the sort of arts and crafts movement. There were something like 10 designers and artists, including Tom Dixon, Andre de Bray, and various other people. Uh, and that was how I liked to do things. I wanted it to be full of kind of tensions and mixtures and not just uniform application of style. So we all went to a viewing theatre on Charing Cross Road, VFI space, and we watched La Dolce Vita together. <coughs> and it was from that that this project was born. And when it was um, completed, I think it shocked all the people who had criticised us in London, and they'd said, oh, NATO stuff, pretty pictures could never be built. But then it was built, and um, it was in the centre fold of, of uh, Blueprint. And I were, when I got off the plane, I was invited to go and give a talk at the RIVA. And all of a sudden, I was grown up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some years later, the wall, typical Naji project. It's not of the style of the moment, necessarily, but it has a, a kind of impossible hypothesis behind it. The client wanted a building that represented the past, but also represented the future. So I thought, well, that's really, really difficult. How do you do that? And um, I plumped for the possibility that, that comes from so many European buildings, particularly Italian and Roman buildings, where something might have been built two millennia ago, but is still being transformed even today. So I pretended that the Romans had been to Tokyo and left a piece of wall, a piece of aqueduct or defensive wall, which um, uh, would, um, could be continuously transformed. This was to be a so-called multi-tenant building. In other words, the very program itself was intended to keep changing. And indeed, the various tenants on the floors do change and continue to change. At one stage, there was a a celebrated Italian restaurant on the roof with Brian Clark um, stained glass windows. And uh, there was an all-male uh, performance bar in the basement that you know, hen parties used to hang out in. Anyway, it's in a great part of Tokyo. <laughs> and it's survived. It's exactly the same now, representing as it does this kind of transformational condition where it's both heavy, it's got stone, it's got kind of um, weight, that refers to uh, um, ancient masonry, which incidentally was built by two builders from the little village I go to in Italy. 
and they turned up in Tokyo with their little paper hats with the name of their local building supplies on the top. <laughs> and they had to deal with the fact that the Japanese thought that Italians, they'd heard Italians are lazy. <laughs> but they built, in a week, they built all that. So not lazy. <laughs> and then in front, this cast iron grill, a bit like the structure on a gasometer, suggests that the building isn't finished or it will be altered. At least that was the idea. Another building, slightly different, I'm just giving you quite sort of varied examples. Back in Britain, this is uh, one of the early drawings for the, um, the Pop Museum, Pop Music Museum in Sheffield, which uh, is based on four steel drums. The idea being that the exhibits in each can be approached in any order that you like. Um, you can go into one and then zip across. There was in, an inside, there's an auditorium, there's a history of music, there's a lot of um, musical instruments that you could bash away at, and there was a, a sort of cultural history of pop in another one. And it wasn't any good what was inside, and I had absolutely nothing to do with it, I just provided the volumes. Um, but uh, you know, it sits in Sheffield as a kind of alien object. I mean, it's sort of alien, but it's made of steel, which makes it part of Sheffield. It also defines a cross, which is exactly part of that uh, area of Sheffield that is built on a grid. So it takes the grid, it takes the grid inside the plot, and it plays freely with a kind of slightly confusing but absolutely regular way of placing objects and therefore encouraging a capricious uh, use of the building. It also exists on two levels, so you can kind of the play between one level and another, that each is the paradigm of the other. Um, and um, that kind of play with, uh, with to, to, to render uh, a very um, clear typological condition, such as four circular um, um, marks in, a, in, in space, uh, can produce uh, wonderfully complex configurations of space. And, uh, well, in the Millennium Dome, uh, I came rather late to the project. Uh, the figure was originally meant to be a sitting figure, and then they said, when we got invited to kind of take the project forward, the client body said, well, it can't be black, and it can't be white, it can't be yellow, and it can't be male, and it can't be female. So it has to be all that. So it was the original, you know, um, uh, gender dysmorphic figure, and uh, um, and was, despite the Millennium Dome being somewhat compromised, it was super successful. It was near the entrance, and uh, seven and a half million people trundled through it, going in through uh, the space between. In fact, I should say the male part is the left and the right part is female, but they sort of embrace each other. But you go in here between the two figures and then go, there were two exhibition spaces on the lower level and then you go on a ramp up to the elbow to here and then there was an escalator that went up inside the arm and uh, on the this level, there was a giant heart higher than this room pumping. And in order to make it spectacular for the visitor, the, the heart uh, would, well, there would, the soundtrack would, uh, the, the body would encounter, would encounter a road crash. So you'd hear the screeching tires and all, and then the heart would go, <laughs> look like this. <laughs> Get that for it, but, um, very big, and I'm proud of it actually, because I had wonderful fun doing it. It was, like all architecture, a set of a compromises about how people flow through the space, because it's all about getting the numbers through, that's why you have escalators, so that people will continuously pass through it. It's also, you know, a piece of narrative architecture in the tradition of the, 18th, of the 1951 Festival of Britain, uh, and um, we built it entirely with uh, uh, digital techniques, and it was the first project in which we positioned each tile according to the model 
and uh, could, each child could be located exactly, of course, on the structure inside it. We had a computer there, and they could move stuff around until it coincided with the model on the computer. So this is, uh, it's hard to, um, to summarize a way of doing all of this uh, without kind of oversimplifying it. But what I would like to say is that the sense of the place, the, the program or the function, the use, are equally important, as is a narrative, a set of ideas that come from outside the situation, come from somewhere else, they might come from somewhere you've been, they might come from a movie, they might come from uh, uh, a typological condition. You could design a restaurant in London based on a Moroccan market. It would be in a restaurant, it would be, have clear function, it would be in a certain place, and so on. Um, I'm going to race through the last bits. Uh, I did a thing in, in um, Tate Modern in 2007, which was part of a show called Global Cities. And I was asked to do a vision of the Thames Gateway. And don't forget, it was Tate Modern. It wasn't the RIBA, so it had to be kind of free-spirited. And so I made a landscape that was made up of found objects, like the bales of cotton and sweets and razor blades and shoes, even. Went to Portobello every weekend for several weeks, just accumulating stuff that might appear in this um, vitrine, which was eight meters long, and represented that part of London between the Isle of Dogs, Canary Wharf, and uh, all the way down to Random Marshes and beyond. Uh, and um, this bit I called Dagen Hamburg, and it's got a set of towers that are made from uh, a hand. It seems crazy, but is it really? If you see some of the towers being built at the moment in London, like the one on um, you know, Blackfriars Bridge, which looks like one of these fingers. Or it looks like something else as well, but I'm not going to say what. <laughs> and. Uh, I've kind of become, in this sort of bricolage spirit, I've become uh, renewed, re sort of equally enthusiastic about that kind of assembly, transformation and assembly as I was years ago. But now using materials we found, 3D models we found, or paid little for on the internet. So this is 10 years ago. Um, there's a little film just showing you, it's a bad film because I'm walking with the camera. But it shows you a mixture of, of 3D <laughs> printed uh, projects, some of which were real ones, some of which were imaginary. Uh, little TVs. Um, it's not hard to key into everybody's ability to be able to see a city where there isn't one. And um, that's something that I, I've done over and over again, is kind of make city imaginary city installations, which are intended not to be built, but to be built in your mind. That's the point. And I'm going to finish off with a project that I'm doing right now. And um, it's based in, this is a horrible quality, I know, but it's, uh, it doesn't matter. It's Vauxhall. They're, they're called Spring Gardens now, this area. And I don't know if you know it, but it's, uh, it's a travesty, really, because it was this area, all the way down to the river, was Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens. Remembered now for some kind of little gazebo in tiles in the tube station. And there is still this park. Uh, some years ago, there was a balloon, Montgolfier, which uh, suggested an understanding of what the Bronx or Pleasure Gardens were about. So this project is, I'm calling it Brexter City, because it's, uh, the attitude is, to hell with Brexit, we're going to have a good time anyway. So, um, it's applying some of these ideas. Uh, I went there yesterday, and this is what it looks like, Spring Gardens. It's not quite spring there, there's a bit of blossom. And there's one of those dreadful buildings, those awful buildings, uh, region place or region no George George Wolf, and and the Terry Farrell MI6, 
But these two, they look as though they're going to be demolished soon. The railway arches, which used to be the center of the gay world in London, but most of the spaces seem to be empty. So that world was evaporated. So I start to put together drawings over a year ago, where I was really playing with replacing bits, buildings, and bits of cities with other structures and forms, which are basically uh, to do with what I'd found on the internet. Here's a kind of upside down pear that's standing in for the, for the balloon. And here's a snake, which is, has turned into a shopping center. And here's a reclining figure again. And here's a kind of egg carton with a load of eggs in it, which I thought was a good starting point for doing public housing. <laughs> and here's some canoes and some skirts upside down and the Venus of Villendorf. And MI6 building has been far more frank about what it is and got some gigantic missiles. <laughs> so, I want to show you an accelerated version of how this project is moving. And I'm not afraid of tracing paper, of heavy duty pens and pencils, of laying things on top of each other, and just trying to find out what I've got. Um, there's even this one, there's a pig with his legs up in the air, which looks a bit like Battersea Power Station. But anyway, that's a very early version. And then, of course, I've got all my digital models, including this one. Uh, I've cut the, his head and his two arms off and laid him down. And you can see him. Uh, come on. There he is on the left with one leg <coughs> over the railway line. But, I mean, it seems amusing, but if you stop and think about it, I th what I'm trying to do is to tease out certain kind of sensations and possibilities that the city perhaps has already, but don't present them in an unfamiliar way. Snake, eggs turn into housing, canoes, the arm went later. So this is quite early. I thought this is horrid, this drawing. I said to the team, you know, we can't do this. It's just that it's dead. It's really awful. So I went back to my own sketchbook. Here it is, sketchbook, my blessed sketchbook. And try to figure out how to transform and make it more architectural in its um, manifestation and in the understanding. And it's not like you can conceive something in your head and it's a fully formed piece of architecture. At least I think anyone who says they can do that is lying. So, sketchbook. And then, in that day, I was kind of into the Hieronymus Bosch Garden of Earthly Delights. I don't know if you know that painting. And I looked for pornographic images on the internet and printed them out. And thought, this is kind of what I'm talking about. That's what it's supposed to be like. <laughs> And lots of layering with the purpose of this was to, I put this, this tracing is over the top of the outline of David. And I try to imagine the flaws that might be inside David, because I want David to be a night world, like nightclubs and baths and other stuff, and also a hotel. So you could kind of switch between the two. And I know that sounds nutty, um, but, there is a certain practicality in trying to think about how a public could move between levels. So you see these kind of weird junctions. That junction is suggesting that this is a continuous surface with no staircases. And in order to explain it to the team, I made a load of paper models, which I'm super pleased with. <laughs> because it's as though someone else did them, but I did them myself. <laughs> and um, it enabled me to understand what it'd be like inside that body. You know, all things that we tell our students, and you've heard it umpteen times before, before do the views, allow, allow people to see inside. So this is part of the inside of the body. It's got some of my real chairs in the picture too. And I'm sort of having fun doing watercolours. They're only this big, these drawings. And there's the leg 
kind of over the archways. And I think in this medium, which is of course more refined than the slightly played, you know, very investigative sketches I showed you in the sketchbook, in these drawings I'm trying to summarize and just with a few lines sum up what um, this place is about. And on the right is one of the eggs, which I've since decided should be unaffordable housing. <laughs> and here they are, the unaffordable houses, with, with soldiers, um, red soldiers, and with a spoon, which is supposed to have uh, uh, antenna for mobile phone networks and all of that. And in Spring Gardens, which was so boring in the image I showed you earlier, I think it should have exciting things in it that you don't really know what they are. Are they architecture? Are they toys? Are they, are they attractions? What are they? And I'm just going to end with a little, a little vignette of the whole project as it currently stands. And there's no way that it's finished. It's a work in progress, probably like um, what you were doing right now. Uh, so, just to, uh, to stress the, what we're doing tomorrow, we're thinking, we're looking at, we're researching, we're bringing stuff together that is relevant to a project, we're communicating it to the other people. So, for those of you who are coming to my uh, workshop tomorrow, take note of this because you'll be expected, um, and I hope enjoy um, working with all of that. And that's it.